the director's cut. Okay. So hello everybody and welcome to the 12th episode of Fiberside Chats. And thank you so much for those of you that are joining me during the live. I really appreciate it. And today my special guest is going to be Michelle of MAV Elements. So if you would like to come ahead, you know, come on to the um the the chat with me here. And so I'm just gonna make sure that your camera is on. Okay, all right. So hopefully we can see you there. Okay, great. Welcome, welcome. Um, so yeah, to be here. So, thank you. Yeah, we can hear you. Great. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so today um, I'm going to be interviewing Michelle. I'm going to be asking her a couple of questions about how she got into the fiber arts world and making shawl pins and all of the wonderful things that she creates. So if today is your first time joining us, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to go ahead and put it into the um, comment section on the, the Facebook live that you're watching. And then at the end, I will go through the comments and share them with Michelle so that um, we can answer the questions that you may have for us. Okay, so without further ado, the official welcome. So welcome, welcome, Michelle. Thank you so much for being my special guest today. I appreciate it. Well, thank you, Alana. It's my pleasure to be here. All right. So yeah, so um, one of the things that, you know, I'm really excited and interested about in being able to interview people in the wool and fiber arts group that are, you know, the vendors and the artisans and um, the dyers and, and all the different people that it takes to make the fiber world go round. And so I'm so excited to be able to talk to you because, you know, as far as um, the, the, the way that you got into the, the fiber um, realm, so to speak, right? And as far as like, I know with, with the um, shawl pins is that those are more of like, um, I would say like a, an, an accessory or a decorative element, but they can really make a piece so, so special and so magical. And so there's like all the different, you know, people that are part of the, the community, right? We have the tool makers and stuff like that, but I just, I love the, the way that um, shawl pins just kind of like add a little bit of flair, if you will, to a project. So I'm just kind of curious, like, how did you get into this um, making of shawl pins? And just to give us a little bit of a background of what excites you about being a shawl pin maker. Oh, what a great question. Well, what a long, strange trip it's been. Mm -hmm. um, so I had a store and my store kind of morphed into a yarn shop um, out of my love of knitting. So um, I guess it all started with my love of knitting, which um, really began to appreciate after my mother died and I was knitting and all of a sudden I had a moment of peace. You know, I was so torn up with grief and I'm like, boy, there's more to this knitting than just, you know, making a, a scarf or a sweater. So that's when I incorporated knitting into the store that I had more for the holistic aspect of it. Um, so many years later, after having the yarn shop and I taught some knitting classes, uh, I was looking for shawl pins. Well, decades earlier, I used to make jewelry and go to art shows. So I'm like, well, I'm going to make a shawl pin because I didn't, I couldn't find any that really resonated with me and were my, my style. So I made one and it was actually based off of my wedding band. Um, I don't know if you can see that, but it's the white mm -hmm. gold and yellow gold. Um, and my first shawl pin was um, aluminum and anodized aluminum. So it's silver and gold. And I wore it and customers saw it and liked it and wanted it. So I started making them for them. Um, then I started carrying it at the store. And then I had a lovely customer who said, can make earrings to match? And I'd never seen that before. So made earrings and then eventually um, created a business out of it. It became MAB Elements. And then I eventually closed the yarn shop. And now I'm fortunate to be able to make the shawl pins and stitch markers and earrings full time now. Wow. Wow. That, that's long, awesome. long answer to a short question. No, no. I mean, but that, but see, that's, that's the thing that I think is so wonderful about the whole fiber arts community, right? There's so many different avenues and paths and ways that we can get into it. And that, you know, you started with, with knitting and, you know, I just think that like the way that you got into it, right? So I know you said you had the store, but like, what was it that got you interested or excited about knitting to begin with? Um, at first, I really wasn't that excited about it until I had that experience with the peace, um, the moment of peace. So my store um, had a lot of yoga and meditation items, essential okay. oils and things like that, a lot of natural products. Um, and I started knitting just because it was fall. I knew I was going to be home with my husband watching some television and wanted to have something to keep my hands busy because I can't stand to just watch television. So I was walking around one of the big box stores and I'm like, knitting perfect. I'll try that. 
and I tried it. And then once that sort of clicked, it was probably about two years into it when I had that experience. And then I was just an avid knitter. I mean, I knit while kayaking. I knit while doing a walking tour of Vancouver. I mean, you know, you know, if any knitters are out there, you know that once the bug gets you, it, it bites hard. Um, yeah, so, no, and, 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 you know, like the, the reason that I ask is because, you know, you, you brought up like so many, um, you know, things like so many things about, about knitting that, that also like resonate with, with me too. Right. And, and the fact that when, when you start, you know, it just might be either, um, you know, a hobby or just like you said, like something to keep your hands busy. And, and I find that when you bring your knitting places, I don't, I don't know if this is also true for you too, right? But like when you bring your knitting places to me, it's almost like a security blanket. Like I know that if there's something that's boring, like a doctor's office that you have to sit in and wait, or, you know, if you're um, going someplace that's maybe like in public and you're just going to have to be hanging around for a while, that it's really comforting to know that you have this, this, Thing that you could do with your hands like you know instead of like fidgeting or like looking at a phone and, and and all of that um but then you know it's also really cool because to me it's also like a marker of time you know and so when you're saying that you're watching tv like for the most part if you're sitting on the couch you don't really have anything to show for that which is not to say that you have to be productive all the time but the right. idea that you know when you when you work on projects they can really have um, the, the time period that you were working on them, it brings you back to those memories and you'll remember, oh, that's right. I remember I was at this point in my life when I was working on this project or, you know, this is where I got this yarn. And so it's got a really neat way almost to of like being a diary keeper and the fact that, you know, you had this experience as you were, um, you know, going through the stages of grief with your mom and, and knitting, you know, like you said, also became something that, that gave you this piece. I just, I really find it fascinating how it's not just specifically to make a scarf you know it's not just to make this object but it's also what does the act of making do for us and how does that transform us to the point that you know now here you are today right in this whole new version of yourself that probably when you just had the yoga store it wasn't even something that was even on your radar right Exactly. And so well put that you said that. Yes. Um, when I travel, you know, like you said, you pick up the yarn, you remember the place and, and there are socks that I made when I was traveling through Denali Park. And when I pick up those socks, I'm right back in the park, you know, and even when watching television, there are certain things I can pick up and you remember what you were watching. It's not really conscious. You're not trying to remember it, but it just kind of takes you back there. So I, I agree wholeheartedly that that's a really cool aspect of it. Yeah, definitely. And I think, you know, also while you're doing it in public, you know, you'll see people that will get excited by it because there may be a knit or two and then it starts like conversations or, you know, people may ask you what you're doing. So it's a great way also to connect to people um, when you're in person, but like with, you know, the other um, people that I've, I've interviewed and I've talked with during these fiber side chats that it's been kind of isolating um, being away from people for so long. And, and there is a uh, very much of um, you know like like excitement but also like nervousness about going back to in-person shows and festivals and just kind of seeing our fellow fiber artists in in person again so when you made the transition to go full-time into being um a shawl pin maker and, and making the jewelry was that like during covid was it before you know how like when when was the timeline for that transition for you it was actually right before COVID. Um, so I officially created MAP Elements in 2019 and I closed my yarn shop in, um, I think it was November 1st of 2019 and then COVID hit 2020. And that was my first full year of doing MAP Elements. I had 22 shows booked. And I remember um, I was in Ocean City at the Delmarva Fiber Festival. Um, St. Patrick's Day weekend. And that's really when it hit in this area. I'm from Ohio um, and I was over there and that's when our governor like in Ohio shut down um, the basketball tournaments and everything. So that show was just not well attended obviously. Um, and it was a really, really tough time to have all of those shows canceled and especially being a new business. Um, and thank goodness for wool and fiber arts, because that really was such a blessing and a godsend and continues to be to this day, because now some of the live shows are back in action. But I don't think I have been to a live show since starting wool and fiber arts, you know, being a member of the wool and fiber arts group where someone hasn't at least one person hasn't come up to me at the show and said, 
oh, I know you from WAFA. And that's been super cool to build these relationships virtually over the past two years. And then you actually get to meet the people in person at the show. So, I mean, it's, it's been a fabulous opportunity and, and that's I cool. want to touch back on. Yeah. You just, you just gave me goosebumps because I haven't been yet um, to my first event, you know, in person yet. So I'm kind of like looking forward to that, to seeing, you know, these, like you said, these friends that we've made in these relationships that we've made with people in person. So I'm sorry to cut you off, but oh, no, that's let you know that this, like, <laughs> It was like a very emotional thing. Yeah, because, you know, some of us haven't seen friends that, like you said, we were planning on these reunions. We were planning on these festivals to kind of get together. You know, I know for myself, there was like teaching um, engagements and workshops and things like that that I had. And it was really interesting to try to make the switch. So like, were you were you comfortable in that transition in, in going to selling online? Or what was your first wool and fiber oh. arts selling experience like? Because I know all of us, you know, <laughs> go through these like really um, behind the scenes freak out meltdown moments. So I'm just kind of curious, what was your first one like? Oh, I was panicked. I was, I still get nervous doing it and I've done quite a few of them, um, but absolutely panicked because I am uncomfortable. It's just, I mean, even live shows, I'm an introvert. So live shows are a little bit of a challenge for me sometimes, but to do the, um, the virtual show was a real challenge and continues to be. I mean, the whole week leading up to it, I'm a nervous wreck. Um, and then doing the show and afterwards, it's like, Ah, oh, such a relief to be over with. But I mean, it's so value added to do them. And I mean, you guys do such a great job of walking the vendors through the whole process and the support is unparalleled. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, um, I mean, in some ways I look forward to it, but overwhelmingly the emotion is apprehension <laughs> leading up yeah, to the and show. You know, I think, and I think that happens too, like in person with like in-person events, you know, there's like this nervous excitement that goes in and, you know, even before doing the interview, I know a lot of people that sure. um, when I do these, yeah, there, there's nerves, but, you know, I think personally it's because when, when you care about something, right? Like even as a teacher, the night before the first day of school, the, the nerves let you know that you care about what you're doing, you know? And so it's not something that you're doing because you know, you're, you're staring at the clock, you know, waiting for it to be 5 p.m., right? Like we're doing this because we love it and we care about what we do and we care about the things that um, like our customers say, right? And, the, and, and that we wanna have like a good relationship with people and, and like be good representatives of our products too. Um, but yeah, it can be very nerve wracking, especially like if you're having a difficult time transitioning with like the technology, for example, you know, i.e. me in the beginning and not turning off the volume on Facebook, so I'm echoing. Um, so, you know, like no matter how seasoned we are, we always are gonna have these like bloopers and flops and stuff like that. But it's, it's so great to know like in my mind, the way that I picture it is that I'm talking to a friend that I haven't spoken to in a while and they get it, you know, they, they understand that there's this like awkward weirdness of being the camera person and being, you know, the, the presenter and, and, and all of that. But um, yeah, I think that- My strangest experience was probably when I lost power. It was probably <laughs> 15 minutes before doing a show and the whole thing was done in candlelight. I have oh, a little... <laughs> that's like setting the mood right <laughs> yes and it was it was near like it was I think October or September so it was kind of near Halloween but yeah I had candles back here and my laptop was on battery mode and I have the little <laughs> hot spot so I mean I was just grateful that I was able to go through it and everybody was very understanding but yeah, yeah. it's always some things happen but the show must go on definitely definitely yeah and you know like you said you know there, there are things that are happening in person but um, you know, it's it's also nice to know, especially too, like as maybe show season ends and we get back to like the winter times when like I know I'm in New York, so going out and, and doing things outdoors doesn't really happen very frequently. So it's just nice to know that there's a place that you can go and kind of share your projects with people, answer questions, and just still have that community knowing that once we kind of go quote unquote back to normal, we're gonna still have those connections and still have those friendships that, that we've made because it, it definitely feels like um, you know, kind of when you, you, I don't want to compare this to going through combat, but like when you go through a difficult situation with people that it can, it can really make you feel bonded, you know? So if you think of like going through orientation with people at college, and maybe you're like still friends with those people or, you know, going through things that are a little bit difficult in life, having that 
community to kind of lean on where everybody understands what that feels like. It's, I think that's um, another beautiful aspect of the fiber arts community that maybe most people didn't really tap into before the pandemic. You know, maybe we would go more towards like the guild or like you said, the yarn shops and, and those were the places that we would congregate. But it's also nice to know now too that we can also congregate in these in these online forums. So that's, that's something that I think excites me about it, but we're, we're, we're here to talk about you and, and, and the things that you do. Okay, so with regards to shawl pins, right, because um, I'm someone that when I wear a shawl, I know that those take a really, really long time to, to make, right, especially if you're going to use something that is a fine thread, like, um, you know, a, a fine weight yarn, so like lace weight and, and fingering weight and just things that can be very delicate in nature. So do you have any, like, suggestions for those of us that might be a little bit nervous about putting maybe like sharp metal objects near our our knitting is there a certain way maybe to wear shawl pins or like style them or is there something unique to your pins that makes them safe to put on knitwear because I'm not familiar with you know the the, the right way to wear a shawl pin if you will <laughs> all right well great well I will show you this is the um original pin and what makes these great for like you said finer weight fabric is that they're very lightweight they they're made out of hand forged aluminum um, some of them have gemstones. This is just the plain original one. And the tip is blunt. So that means it shouldn't pierce the fabric or it shouldn't um, split the mm -hmm. fibers. It should sort of gently nudge its way through. Um, I can show you like to use it. This isn't really delicate, but you can imagine it's the same thing. And if you have a very lightweight fab fabric, it won't weigh it down. And okay. you just sort of push it through and then pull it out and then through there. Um, and I'll show you on a silk scarf how lightweight they are because even on this silk scarf, it won't weigh it down. Oh, wow. So you can even use it with fabrics that are not necessarily um, made of yarn or knitted, like you can use it with like actual fabric. Right, in this case, you're not going to put the pins through the fabric. You're gonna put the stick through the loop okay. and then just sort of push the fabric between the stick oh. portion of the back and the front and then stick it through the other loop. So you can see, it doesn't even weigh this down. It's, I mean, it weighs less less than an ounce. Yeah, um, and I mean, just like even this. you taking that jewelry, you know, piece and like, like putting that shawl pin on, it just it just makes it look so like special and dressed up and you know like for the fancy occasion as opposed to just you know grabbing something and putting it on. It just makes it look really special. And it kind of completes the look, and it's also functional because it keeps that um, shawl or a scarf in place. Mm -hmm. And then also I have magnetics. So those don't damage the fabric at all. So um, like clip the, on earrings these... for shawl. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, you just have the, you have your two pieces and you just put it wherever you want it. And there you go. And what's nice about that, you can also put it through your garment underneath your shawl. So oh, sometimes okay. when you have your shawl and even if you have it pinned, it'll still kind of rotate around, but with the magnetic, it won't because you can just secure it that way. So, so And these are super, any... super strong. Okay. I don't know if you have any like shawls um, nearby that you can that you can um, demonstrate this, but I'm, I'm always curious too, because like you have some people that like to wear the shawls in the front with like the point going down and obviously it depends on the way the pattern is designed. And then some people like to wear it with the point in the back. So with the shawl pin, does it matter like which way you put a shawl on? You know, as Absolutely far as like- not. How, However you put it on, however you insert that pin, that is the way it will stay. Let me see if I can grab my model here. Of course, the um, the shawl that I have, I think, is asymmetrical, so okay. I don't know. So the point is kind of, we'll just pretend that that's in the middle. Sure. So if you want yep. it in the middle, you can just kind of wrap it around. And then hopefully this is yep. on camera. You caught me with this one, Alana. I wasn't Sorry. prepared for this. <laughs> um just so everybody then, knows see this is not scripted okay these are these are genuine conversations we're having here okay that's right um let's see and then you can just oh, the, nice. I always like to wear it off to the side and then that will secure it and hold that tail in place so when you bend over or you open the door your scarf or your shawl isn't flopping open and then you yeah, can just like, do that. Same that's, yeah, that's the thing that's like really annoying when it's like it's going in your face and you bend down and you're kind of like smacking it out of your face. Like, no, stay on my, like, stay up, stay up. So that's that's really um, right. Interesting right. Wearing our beautiful creation shouldn't be a challenge. 
So hopefully the shawl <laughs> pin will help it be enjoyable. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. Um, so you said that that was aluminum and what, what other materials do you like to do? Like, have you ever, cause I, I know you said you um, did it with like silver and gold. Are there other materials that you like to work with? Well, originally I used to do a lot with solid sterling silver. And then I recently have switched to aluminum because I really prefer aluminum because it's so much lighter weight and also it won't tarnish or change color. So a lot of my earrings are now made out of aluminum. Um, and then the magnetic pins are copper. So they're all hand forged copper. And I'm so, so I was always envious of the indie dyers because I got to play with all those colors and it looks like so much fun. But now I get to play with colors. Nice. Um, so these are hand forged copper. Each one is signed and numbered. They're one of a kind. So I really like to work with all kinds of different um, metals, but primarily I use aluminum and copper, um, a little bit of brass. So like I have these um, mixed metal earrings and I'm working on, believe it or not, working on things for the upcoming holiday season. So working on some necklaces and things using the three different metals. Um, but that's, those are the materials I really like and the natural stones. So on the website, you'll see a bunch with different, different stones. So, so yeah. And I, oh, I'm sorry, you, you keep going. So I just, I mean, I love being able to work with the stones and, you know, a lot of the stones have variation in them. So just, you know, there it's just the beauty in nature. And then also the, the vibrant colors, you know, inspired by the different indie dyers. So. So when you have on your, um, on top of the, the, the copper part, right? So like, is that um, like glass or is that enamel or what, like, how do you get the color? In oh, it? great question. So I start with copper sheet and I cut it and then I hand forge it. This one, I think you can really see the texture. So they all have a texture on them. Mm -hmm. um, and then I put a patina on some of them. Um, this one has a black patina and then layers and layers of ink over top of that. Oh, okay. And then two to four coats of a glaze on top of that. So they're very, very shiny. I don't know if that comes through on the yeah. camera or not. And um, well, yeah, well, and I'm a little bit. What, 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 what kind? What kind of um, inks do you use? Um, the alcohol inks, all different kinds of alcohol inks. So do you do like, so I, like a layer of plastic and then like a layer of color so that it's kind of like different depths, or is it like all on one layer? Nope. The um, the glaze goes over the inks so the inks are all in one layer and some are oh, okay. opaque and some are translucent and then that glaze just seals it in and gives it the dome texture as well and the gloss nice nice yeah no and the reason that i ask i don't know if you've ever seen um these artists do this but like i'm, I'm always fascinated that um there's this one artist and i don't know their name so forgive me but I'll, I'll put it in the comments and i'll go like research after but there's this artist that will um, take paint and kind of paint on different layers of like this clear epoxy resin, and it'll make it he'll, he'll make it look like there's a koi fish like swimming in, you know. Oh, I've seen of, that. Yeah, I don't know what that like style of art is called, but I just think that layering of you know dimensions with paint on a flat surface is just so interesting. And then there are other people that they'll use like nail polish and glitter and like all sorts of cool things like that, you know, and um, I'm not necessarily like a, a 3D artist, but I'm always fascinated by the way that um, people will take materials and use them in, in different ways. And so I think that's really cool that you wanted to, do, um, you know, play and explore with color. And so that the inks was like a way that you could, you could do that. So those are, those are super cool. So do you find yarn that you like the colors of? Cause I know you said you, you want to, um, you know, be with the, with the indie dyers and, and, and play with colors. So do you, do you like to start with yarns and then get inspired by the colors that the, the yarns that the indie dyers use, or do you like to make your pins and then try to find, you know, indie dyers that kind of like use those same colors to pair them together? Great question. Um, I am inspired by a lot of different things. One of my favorite projects that I've worked on was a collaboration with, there were, I think, eight indie dyers and a pattern designer, and it was called um, Cooperate Shawl. So oh. each indie dyer dyed a certain color, and then the designer put all those colors together in a shawl, and then I did a shawl pin to match. So in that case, I was inspired by the yarns. And there's a yarn shop in Williamsburg, Virginia called The Flying Needle. So I want to give her a little plug. She has a yarn crawl going on and has a trunk show there right now. But for the past two years, she will, for the yarn crawl in the area, um, dye a particular batch of yarn inspired by something. This year's inspiration is Mermaid. And she also has a bag maker make a bag. And then she has me make a pin so that they all match um, and go together. And then, so those are like some of the custom jobs that I do. 
And then my personal inspiration a lot of times comes from nature. I have an Aurora Borealis collection that has a lot of um, purple and blue and green in it. And then sometimes a photograph, a friend of mine posted a, uh, a picture on Facebook entitled Yellow Monday. And it was like this pixelated picture that she had taken. And I just love the concept of Yellow Monday. Um, Cause I don't know if you're, you've ever heard of that. I had not heard of it until I saw that, but like blue, people talk about blue Monday. Everybody's all sad about going back to work or school and yellow Monday is kind of just, let's turn that upside down. Yellow is a happy, positive color. So on Monday, wear something yellow to give you some joy and happiness. And then every time you look at it, think, yeah, it's positive. So I don't know, all about positive thinking and how we can, you know, positively in influence our mood and environment. No, I mean, that's, that's such a, a powerful point that you're making, because, you know, I think sometimes we get into these ruts where, you know, like, you know, Monday is kind of the start, and then we just follow this um, almost like automaton, or like, we just kind of go through, you know, the motions, and we don't, we don't really try to be conscious of what we're experiencing, even if we're going to work, right? That, you know, sometimes they'll just show up to work and you don't even remember driving there. It's just not, now you're there and you just kind of went through the motions of it. But when you can infuse little things like that, that will be reminders like, hey, wait, you know, pause, take, take, take a minute to like appreciate, you know, maybe the sound of the rain and, and all of those things that maybe we just take for granted or we see the, the negatives of them. That can be a really um, powerful way of, of transforming our perspective and also our experience. And so I think even like you said, like having something um, like a, a shawl pin that you're putting on just kind of can transform your whole not, not even just like your outfit, but just it's like a little special thing that you have with you. Like I know that there are special pieces of jewelry, like earrings, that if I'm having a really rough day, you know, um, and let's say someone, you know, specially gave it to me and I'll put them on and, and it just makes me feel like they're with me. And I have that, you know, um, the little boost of like morale with me too. So I think that's a wonderful way of using like you said, that, that Yellow Monday concept of trying to just stop and try to reframe things in, in a more positive way. So I, I like that. That's, that's really cool. So when you said you have a collection of Aurora Borealis, like pictures or like artwork, or what, what do you mean you have a collection? Well, I do a collection of shawl pins. So each one oh, is- Oh, okay, okay. So I thought you meant like you collect, I'm like, how, how does one collect light in the sky? <laughs> yes, that's a good question. But it's funny what you were talking about there as far as inspiration. When I first started um, MAB Elements, my tagline was inspired by nature, crafted by hand. And then I went through a workshop about what really, what is your mission with your business um, and sort of narrowed it down. And I'm in the process of changing my tagline to inspire joy. So it's kind of like just what you said. I want to create pieces that speak to people. And when they see it, it's just like, oh, that really resonates with me. And when I look at that, it gives me just a little bit of joy. Um, and that's really what my mission is right now to you know, do a variety of things and hopefully, hopefully it'll speak to people and, and bring joy to their life. Well, um, when, when you were exploring materials and I know, like you said, you have stones and, and other um, metals and, and, and um, earrings and things like that. I'm curious, have you, have you ever worked with other materials too, like wood or, you know, felt or like other things that maybe could be incorporated into the, um, the shawl pins that maybe like other shawl pins might be made out of material wise or is just metal really what speaks to you? Metal's really what speaks to me, the metal and the stone, stone and metal, um, but you never know. So that'll be percolating in my mind what you just said. Uh, a lot of the items that I have have been suggestions from customers or requests, like the magnetic pins. And I started, I had a couple of different, different versions. Um, and then I don't even know how I came up with this ink on copper and glazed um, process, but it is probably my third rendition of uh, try to magnetic shawl pin, but this is the one that really sticks with me. Well, and I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm curious too, because I know um, even with like Fimo clay and polymer clay, how they have, you know, the, the matte base, but then you can make them glossy too, and just get all sorts of cool, you know, effects. And I don't know, I think that's probably something that um, if I were to make shawls, like I would go down the rabbit holes of like trying everything. So I really admire people that are like, nope, this is what I'm good at. And I don't mind exploring, but like, this is, this is what, you know, I'm good at. And the reason too, that um, I was asking is because 
when, when I was in college going to be um, an art teacher, we had to pick electives to take. And I was like, well, I could take fibers, but I, I know that already for the most part, you know, like I'm familiar with it. So I wanted to take classes that I wasn't really strong at in hopes that I could get better to share my experiences with, with my students. So over here, I have this little crappy, um, well, not crappy. I mean, I don't say that. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it was cool, but um, my, my professor said that it was too childlike, I think. And I think that's just kind of my nature. I'm a little bit, you know, silly, but here. So I made this little spider. I don't know if you can see. It's like a little. Oh, cute. Yeah, and, he, and he's got like moving parts and everything like that. And I wanted to have it be something that could like hang too. Um, but all the little legs were getting caught up and, and all of that. So when I love when the I movement talking, in it. Yeah, yeah, but, but like when I was soldering and everything, I thought like, oh my goodness, like how do people make jewelry? This seems like the most, I don't know, like like not not challenging but just like getting the right temperature and like knowing how to get the pieces and, and parts to go together so do you have like a special studio set up or like how do, how do you get all of these things um made because yours obviously you know you're you're a professional and it looks professional but mine is just like <laughs> oh yeah. well I do have a space that I have a studio that I work out of this is part of it that I have set up because I do some virtual shows here but yeah I have a workbench and I have all my stones and little drawers and and the different metal um and I did do a little bit with the precious metal clay but I just didn't I don't know it just you know when you try something it's either clicks with you or it doesn't click with Definitely. you uh, and I just really loved like the metal bending and forming and cutting and, you know, it's, it's very satisfying for me. And that's what makes the world go around. Everybody has their different um, likes and dislikes and strengths. And well, how, how did you get into jewelry in the first place? Like, did you go to college for it? Did you just take a couple of classes and then it went from there? Did you teach yourself? How, how did, how did that start? I am self-taught. I actually, I have an engineering degree. So I went to school and I was an engineer and um, my mom was making jewelry years ago. And I started, um, I learned a little bit from her and then sort of just took off from there um, and took some online classes and just talking to people and getting inspiration and, and looking at things and trying to be like, okay, how can I make that, you know, or how can I make that my own? What's my take on that item? That's, that, I mean, that's, that's really um, so, so amazing to me. Cause like, like I said, just, you know, taking this one course, I felt so intimidated by like the flames and like the, the solder, like all of the, you know, things had to go. So, so what's, what's your favorite um, metal working tool that you use? Cause I know most of us are probably familiar with things like drop spindles and stuff, but do you like the torches or do you like the hammers? What, what's, what's I like the hammers. hammers. <laughs> <laughs> the first time I used a torch, I was, I was pretty nervous. It took me a while to get comfortable with the torch, but I, I love the hammer. I get to take out some of my aggression, not all of it, but some of it. Um, and I just love how I think, raw and basic it is and how you know just with a hammer and you can change the metal and not only change the look of it but also change the properties of it you know harden it up and i think that's just really i don't know powerful yeah no definitely and and it's something that i don't want to say it's like instantaneous results but like you can actually see you know what you're doing like actually happening whereas like for example i don't know if you've ever tried to um like weave or, or like warp a yeah. loom yeah okay so that process it takes you like at least five months before you know what it is gonna look like right that's so, stressful yeah. for me yeah 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 and you know so like if you're gonna do like a traditional you know like this dressing of a loom yeah you can have this idea of what you want your fabric to look like you know and then it takes a lot of courage to get to the point where you feel like mathematically you can wind a warp and then by the time you actually get to the loom it's like okay there's another hurdle and when you actually see what the fabric looks like it takes so long to actually like know if the, all the choices you made ahead of time you know are like actually like accurate to what your vision was but like you said with the hammer you know you can pound something and then you know you hit it too hard or not yeah it's pretty yep that's what it looks like yep it's so funny you talked about with the knitting i just want to go back to that knitting in the car and the doctor's office and things and people who don't knit when they would see me knitting they'd say something like oh you're so patient i'm like actually i'm not patient at all that's why i knit because i never have to wait you know, you're not waiting anymore. Now you're knitting and doing something that you enjoy and something, as you said, productive, not that we need to be productive all the time. No, but. <laughs> but yeah, but I mean, that's, that's something that, um, you know, I've, I've brought up in, in other fiber side chats too. So I hope, you know, people are like sick of me, um, keep bringing it up too. But the idea of um, working with our hands, it, it really affects our brains. And so 
um, growing up, like, you know, I have, I have ADHD and I didn't know that until like last year until, until I was diagnosed, but um, the idea of having sensory and tactile input in our fingers, it actually, you know, does something to your brain to kind of like calm it down and reduce anxiety. And, you know, it just, it makes you able to kind of focus and meditate. And especially because like what you were saying, how you had this holistic store with yoga and all of that, that it really does have that um, like sensory input into one's fingers and the repetitive motion of it, the repetitive like clicking of the sounds, the, the mm -hmm. textural um, tactile quality, they, they all have um, this like rhythmic way of kind of putting your like brain's frequency more, you know, even as opposed to like this, you know? And, and so when, when um, ever like I meet people that really enjoy spinning or knitting or like they get the hang of it, right? So you just have to kind of get over that hump of learning it. And like you said, you know, weaving could be really frustrating to you, but you know, I have this really cool loom that it kind of almost comes ready to go, you know, to weave, right? Like it's almost warped already. So you can just really have fun with the throwing of the shuttle back and forth and just jump right into it as opposed to having like all of these um, kind of like preloaded steps. But the idea of knitting and even spinning on a drop spindle, when, when you go to places, especially like if you have social anxiety or, you know, if the idea of sitting around and waiting, you know, stresses you out. And again, it's not about being productive, but it's about like, you don't want to be fidgeting and just like sitting there like, okay, I have to move. And so with ADHD, it doesn't necessarily have to um, come out in the physical way. Like it doesn't have to be, you know, your leg is twitching or like you have this extra physical energy, but it could be almost um, the hyperactivity of your mind and the racing of thoughts. And so when you're, when you're knitting and you're spinning and you're doing these things that are very repetitive, even, you know, hammering that, that physical activity, um, it, it just kind of gets the, the, the racing thoughts to kind of slow down. And, and I think that, you know, before I took medicine, the only way that that could happen was if I was doing something that was repetitive. So the idea of cooking, right? Like if you're stirring, if you're chopping, you know, so all of those things that require us to use our bodies in these repetitive ways can definitely have a really powerful um, influence on, on our minds. Oh, that's really interesting. Thank you for yeah. sharing that. That's yeah, and, and yeah, and I don't think it necessarily has to be people with you know ADHD in, in general. It's just it's 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 just a natural um, I guess byproduct. So you know yeah, like I knit, but I generally don't wear the majority of the things that I make. But it helps me get through other situations. <laughs> so the knitting is just a byproduct. <laughs> You're a process knitter, not a project knitter. You yeah, enjoy the exactly, process, yeah. not the finished project. Yeah, I was yeah, the same. Yeah, yeah. And so I think that's what's interesting too is that it doesn't matter how long it takes because I'm not necessarily doing it for the, the outcome, even though I might have, you know, an idea of what it is that I'm, I'm, I'm trying to work on, but it's the actual physical act of the, the creation that I think is very, um, you know, therapeutic. So that, that was just my, my, my tangent there. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to see if there was any other questions that I had about shawl pins, because I'm just so excited that I never got to talk to a shawl pin maker before. So I wanted to write them down. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So I think, I, oh, so, so is knitting still your favorite? Have you, have you ever tried um, spinning or I, I know I asked you about weaving, but have you ever tried crocheting or anything else? I have, oh, I maybe tried crocheting for like a couple of hours. Um, <laughs> and <laughs> there was one day at a festival where I was so close to buying a wheel um, because I was spinning there, somebody had a wheel. And I, the, what held me back is there are so many things that I wanna knit that I will never knit as much as I wanna knit in my lifetime. So I don't wanna bring another hobby in, um, even though it's still fiber related and still wonderful. And some of my friends now they enjoy spinning more than knitting even. Um, but I just don't want to take away from my knitting time. Um, and I love the fact that knitting is so portable. You know, I can take it in the car and if I'm waiting for five minutes, I can knit a few stitches. So that's one of the things I love about it as well. So yeah, knitting is definitely in the fiber arts, that's my that's my go to <laughs> for sure. So yeah, so if there are any um, spinners or knitters or knitters that are spinners um, in in the, the the live that are watching us, I'm just curious because I know that um, probably maybe like 50 50 I would say that I spin in public just as much as I knit. So um, I'm curious, ah. like if you are a spinner and a knitter. Um, what is your preferred thing to do if you're going to, if you're going to take a project with you? And so, you know, I can definitely appreciate wanting to, to save like knitting to be this like special thing that you give your attention to, because yeah, there's like so many different, 
you know, areas and rabbit holes that as, you know, fiber enthusiasts, we can, we can go down, right? And um, like you said, you know, sometimes you try things like the, the polymer clay and you decide you don't like it. But I think what's really wonderful about being a spinner, so this is just my, my take on it, is that when you're able to control the yarn that you make, it just has such a different level of joy that you get from when you actually get to the knitting stage because you know all of the things that went into the construction of it. And then you can also like fine tune it and tweak it. So, you know, it's just like a chef, you know, you can either go to the grocery store, buy the food and like prepare it at home, or you can be the gardener that grows it. And you just kind of have a different experience when you're, when you're doing it. So oh, there's definitely time for knitting. Cool analogy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm looking in the, the comments and I'm seeing that um, people are saying I knit shells and wraps and I take knitting, I do spinning. So yeah, so it seems like, you know, that knitting definitely could be the more the more portable of the two. Um, but, you know, definitely bringing a drop spindle. And I guarantee you, if you're looking for conversations, that's just the way to, that's just the way to oh, draw. Oh, I bet. <laughs> attention is just bring a drop spindle and have people like, you know, do that one, I can't quite do it, but like get that one eyebrow raise at you and, and wonder what it is that you're doing. All right, so in the spirit of all of the past um, fiber side chats, we have holidays today. So um, today is Eid al Fitr, or Fitr. So um, for all of you that are Muslim out there that are celebrating that holiday, and today is also Chocolate Custard Day, as well as Garden Meditation today. However, however, the the holiday that we are going to talk about and celebrate um, today is actually Textile Day. So. I'm curious then, um, I know you said that you're interested or that like um, knitting is your thing, right? But as far as the fibers to work with and, and wear, what is your favorite textile material? Ooh, wow, that's a tough one. <laughs> well, my favorite to wear is going to probably be linen. Oh, I really okay. like, like I have this linen vest that I really, really love, but as far as knitting with it, it's probably my least favorite to knit with because it's so, you know, um, not pleasant on the hands, um, to knit with the actual process of knitting, boy, I really like alpaca a lot. Um, but then sort of the flip side to wear, because if you wear pure alpaca, it kind of grows throughout the day. So, you know, it's... <laughs> I, I guess I need to look at whether it's the finished product or the process, but I must be a process knitter because I only have one finished linen project and I have quite a few on the needles and I just pick it up to work with it. And it's just, I just don't care for it. So yeah. Um, and, see, and, that, and that also too depends upon like the way that um, it's, it's spun and, and processed because you can get the yarn and I, I don't know about like you know, people that buy it in the store because I haven't bought linen, com commercial linen yarn. But like when you spin it, you can like um, just kind of beat it up a lot before you actually go to work with it so that it really softens it up. But also, and I don't know if you've ever tried this too, and you can always cut your um, yarn and then try it and then like try knitting with it and see if this works. But if you put it in a skein and just make sure that it's like really tight and, um, you know, like tied up well, you can take it and just throw it in the washing machine right? And like wash it so that it gets like beat up a little bit more oh. um, and it'll soften it before you actually go to, to work with it so that it kind of will, um, if there's any, any like um, not oil, but if there's anything that they use for like processing it into yarn that kind of made it like stiffer, like I know sometimes when people do weavings, they'll put, you know, like glue on it or like different things to kind of like stiffen the, the fibers and the fabric up so that it, it works better when it's being woven. So I don't know if anything like that happens in the actual commercial yarn production stage, but that might just be something that you could, you could try and seeing if that softens it up for your hands. Cause like, like you said, with wearing linen, right? It gets nicer to wear and more um, softer with each wash. So that might be um, something that can help. So I'm curious if you try it out, let me know. If anyone, has, if anyone I, else in the comments uh, or that's watching has any like, you know, comments or suggestions on how to make linen more enjoyable to work with, let me know. And uh, I, I did try uh, wetting it and freezing it, but that didn't really help. I've heard that that was helpful that when the water freezes, the little ice crystals will kind of soften it up. But I found that to not be that true, but I will try washing it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, and I and I also wonder too, because um, I know with like plant fiber, um, it's kind of like with you know a sheep if a sheep is sick or if it has different things that can infect it. I wonder you know where you're getting the the linen yarn from. Um, if the flax was like like how it was um, 
you know, like the, the water season and like all of that, like the way that it's processed and, and all of that, if there's like different ways that it can be treated to make it softer, like almost, um, you know, if you buy like a pre-shrunken t-shirt versus ones that you shrink yourself if, if, if there are ones that are a little bit softer. So if anyone is a, a linen yarn lover out there, um, let, let us know if you have any tips on, on working with linen so that it's not so rough on your hands. Yeah, because like I, I worked with um, a Suffolk fleece that boy, like spinning it was not fun and um, knitting it was not fun, but it makes the best socks, you know? So it's like, yeah. sometimes you just gotta like get in the trenches and use that. Will I do it again? No, but at least I saw, <laughs> at least I saw it through and yeah. Good job finishing. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Okay, so I'm seeing if anyone says, if anyone has any suggestions for us with um, the linen part. No, okay. Um, so then someone, oh, someone was speaking to what we were talking about earlier um, with spinning and knitting. And they said, I spin and knit the yarn, I spin. I usually take a knitting project more than spinning. Yeah, so I think that's what's nice about if you can take your spinning with you, then you're also going to potentially have stuff to knit with. <laughs> oh, well, that's true. Yes. <laughs> so it'll last you longer and you have to pass, pack less in your luggage if space is an issue. So there's there's that, that um, tip about it. Well, Thank you so much, Michelle. I really appreciate your time with me today. Do you have any last parting words for um, anybody that, that is watching? Well, I want to thank you for having me here and taking the time to do this. Well done. And just, you know, the Wafa community, the Woolen Fiber Arts Group, such a great community. And I'm very thankful for everybody who, who comes to the show and participates in the group throughout the month. And it's just, it's been a real blessing, not only for me, but I know some other um, independent makers too. It's really helped us get through a very trying and challenging time. So thank you. All right. Well, thank you so much again. And for everybody that um, if you came in a little bit late or if you'd like to see some more of the Fiberside Chats, just know that you can click on the hashtag Fiberside Chat and they will all come up. It's going to also be up on the Wool and Fiber Arts YouTube channel, so you can check it out there. And again, um, if you have any questions, even if you're watching this on the replay, feel free to just tag either of us in the comments and we can come back and answer your questions. So thank you, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your week and just before we go um so you know the next fiber side chat is going to take place on may 16th so not next week but the week after that and i'm going to be speaking with alina from starnets and we're going to be talking about project bags so i'm so looking forward to that as well all of these wonderful accessories that we can have with our fiber projects so all right everybody so take care and have a great rest of your week and thanks again michelle thank you bye-bye bye-bye